Thank you, Debbie. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Debbie, Michelle, and Benny for putting this together. Uh, really good topic to discuss as uh, this, uh, the treatment and approach to this continues to change. And I also want to thank everyone, all of our uh, participants for the, this symposium. I hope everyone is safe, healthy, and really looking forward to seeing you next year in Arbo in person. So uh, I'm going to talk, even though this is a seminar about new uh, therapies for neurotrophic ulcer, it's interesting how past uh, approaches continue to be new to us. And uh, I would like to talk to you, to you about our experience on total and interiors, concentration, frequency, formulations, and what I think are some of the controversies. So uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, I want to especially thank Benny Yang. Uh, I did not believe in serum tears when I started the Cleveland Clinic uh, almost 18 years ago with Benny. And Benny was the one who really got the serum tear program there. And I was able to experience how really good these therapies for our patients. So Benny, thank you. And also some of the slides I've been using, uh, Benny's been kind enough to share with me. So uh, basically the use of autologous serum tears work goes back to 1984 described by Fox. That's pretty much one of the main preferences used. But it's very interesting. He was our mentor uh, for Benny and I, Dr. Dolman, who actually used serum tears for the first time as a, as a proof of concept to test a pump, a perfusion pump for patients with alkaline burns. And you can see the photo that uh, Benny shared with me from Dr. Langston. This actually is a glass that has a pump on the side and serum tears are actually sprayed to the ocular surface. And Klaus at that point decided that serum tears would be uh, a nice approach to test this technology. And uh, later did he know that uh, we have adopted that with our glasses now. So, uh, you know, the hypothesis and actually facts about why uh, autologous serum tears work, uh, they're certainly different from artificial tears. You know, they contain factors that improve epithelial wound healing, uh, immunoglobulins, vitamins, and of course, neurotrophic factors that we still have to yet identify. When we think of the indications for the use of autologous serum tears, obviously we think of the severe dry eye patient, some patient with ocular surface inflammation, recurrent erosion. But as you'll see, most of the literature that have been studying and established the use of autologous serum tears were for persistent epithelial defects or neurotrophic keratopathy keratitis. Uh, these are the study designs that actually that have been uh, published for the use of autologous serum tears. You can see that there's a combination or a potpourri of retrospective and uh, prospective studies. Uh, most of them using autologous serum tears for 20%, and we'll go into that detail soon. But as you can see, most of the studies really have been done for the treatment of neurotrophic corneal ulcers with relatively good results. Again, with the hypothesis that you can take patient's own blood product with growth factors and apply it to the ocular surface to enhance uh, wound healing or healing of the neurotrophic process. It's incredible. The publication regarding the use of autologous serum tears has continued to grow throughout time. Uh, it's been uh, investigated more, and I would say uh, in the right direction, trying to understand what are the mechanisms of action where uh, this uh, autologous serum product really helps the health of the ocular surface. Moving into how we formulate it, I can give you an example. <clears throat> when I was at Bascom Palmer, we set out what we call autologous serum tier or the serum tier program. And we were trying to, like Jennifer mentioned, trying to make it very friendly user for the patient and for the doctor. So um, we gave a prescription for the patient. Most of our serum tiers were prescribed initially at a dose of 20%, one drop four times a day. Patients can use it up to six times a day. Uh, we used to give them one month supply with three refills. Um, we're still trying to be responsible regarding infection, et cetera. So we were very careful in really trying to maintain this product in a safe fashion, at least until we were able to get uh, more uh, accustomed to it. Um, even though we give it 20%, uh, we had uh, a variety of ranges that it could be used, 20, 30, 50%, and 
And I know that, especially many, have actually used them undiluted. Uh, the limitation of using diluted, of course, you have more growth factors, but it's more difficult to provide because you have to use more blood. But that's the range of concentrations, and the way that I use them is in a way to I start at a lower percentage, move up, except patients that have severe keratopathy or keratitis, I might start at a higher concentration of 50%. So these are data prepared on the laminar hood. We use a red top. That's why uh, we collect the serum, which is a little bit part of the, of the blood. They're spinned, and the serum is collected and actually filtered through the syringe and a 20 micron filter into the bottle that is dispensed and diluted accordingly with preservative-free sodium chloride saline or saline. This, uh, then give it to the patient and uh, the three, one month supply frozen, the patient's taken home and saw them and used them four to six times a day accordingly. Each of these vials last pretty much between seven and 10 days. So that's the formulation and how we prepare them. And what are the controversies? And I think uh, well, the first one that we think is complications. So do we, have, do we get an immune response? like immunoglobulin deposition? Do we have microbial, microbial contamination? And are we putting at risk our technicians that are working with these products? So we actually look into this carefully. We actually look at patients with autoimmune diseases in our clinic that we're receiving uh, autologous serum tears. And there was a variety of patients with rheumatoid arthritis, graphic Sussos disease, Sjogren, Stephen Johnson. And this was a retrospective study. And we were not looking at efficacy or compared to a normal a patient with serum tears, but we were looking for the rate of complication and ability of the ocular surface to heal. As you can see from this graph from this Polish, uh, this Polish study, uh, there was no different if you compare two patients that have a normal immune system on the healing properties of total serum tears. And more importantly, we did not see any complications. And for us, that was one of the most important points that patients with autoimmune diseases or that are in actually some form of immune suppression they don't have bad blood. Their blood is actually good and can be used. Uh, so what about micro microbial contamination? Well, one of the things that we do is actually, it's a clear set of instructions and you can see here. Patients are very well educated how to use them. Obviously we uh, teach them how to not uh, look at the serum tears, make sure there's any type of opacity or turbidity not to use them and come contact with us. And uh, in our experience, a rate of contamination was pretty much zero. Uh, Jose Gomez from uh, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil have seen uh, a number of patients with microbial contaminations and have discussions pretty much that most of the patients that have really severe ocular surface diseases, like Stephen Johnson's patients, their microbe uh, flora might be more prone for infections, but we did not have that experience. And we sent all our samples to microbiology testing. So if we identify any potential contamination on the patient is contacted. We, 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 we treat the, the source of uh, the batch of serum tears and we test them again. Uh, we have not experienced any viral transmission to our technician. We're very careful about this. Every patient gets a high risk questionnaire. In other words, it is a questionnaire that asks if patients have received any blood transfusion or have any blood point diseases. And if, they, if their questionnaire is positive, they're sent to the primary care uh, doctor for uh, uh, further testing. Uh, all our technicians use protective gears, gown, glove, mask. We minimize the use of needles and the hood and the whole area is clean and sterilized accordingly. What about other controversies? Availability. Uh, this is a process that needs to be easy for the doctor and for the patient. And uh, in the past, it's been very difficult because we have not had services that provide that. Jennifer mentioned uh, there are presently in the United States different sources, either a combination of academic institutions that you can see here, or uh, eye banks or small companies that are actually preparing the serum tiers. So the doctor gives the prescription and the a patient goes to the sites and their blood is drawn and they're prepared according to the instruction of the patient. Uh, cost, that's uh, a major here in the United States because we don't have any reimbursement. Uh, this has not been approved by the FDA. So uh, a great discussion that I have with, with Benny and our other uh, serum tier guru, Dr. Pedro Hamran. It's uh, how can we convince uh, local regulatory uh, agencies to have a legislative approval? And that will take the, uh, doing a prospectus randomized trial to test the efficacy of this. In Korea, this is an article that Benny shared with me. 
where they actually are moving in that direction, trying to make autologous CMTs uh, a regulatory and approved process. So that would lead into reimbursement. The other possibility uh, uh, is to provide uh, physicians with small kits where they can actually prepare their serum tears for the patient in the office, uh, minimizing the cost or at least controlling them. Uh, BTI uh, have uh, ex uh, exploded this. I'll talk a little bit more about that as they produce all the hematopoietic products that can be produced in the clinic. This is very similar to what uh, oral surgeons and orthopedic surgeons do that they can actually produce it in their own practice. Uh, what about not enough blood? Some of these patients might not be able to provide blood uh, because of anemia or any other systemic disorders or access to their veins. In uh, Denmark, uh, the use of allogeneic blood products, it's very common. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, can we take sources of blood from the uh, bank that are being uh, not used? And if there's screen and positive, can that be used as an allogeneic product to be distributed? And uh, what about new, new factors? Uh, maybe other hematopoietic products that have more neutrophic factors. And one of them is PRP or platelet-rich plasma. We learned this from orthopedic surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, where instead of taking the serum, they take the plasma, which actually has more growth factors as documented by any two uh, at all. Uh, Dr. Alio in Spain, one of the first ones to use PRP to treat uh, dormant corneal ulcers with a very good success. And uh, they grew from Spain, Anitua and Jesus Merayo have continued to expand the use of uh, what they name plasma-rich growth factor, which is similar to PRP for the treatment of uh, ocular surface diseases and neurotrophic ulceration. Uh, there are two sources uh, from Spain. BTI produces the PRGF. We have experience with this uh, product. It's, again, instead of taking the serum, we take the plasma. And there's a new company in the United States that is exploiting the possibility of standardizing this cambium with, uh, for allogeneic human platelets and distribution. This is an example of one of my patients that did not respond to serum tears and endotrophic ulcers. Uh, we started treating with uh, PRGF or platelet growth factor. And in a period of almost a week, 10 days, we had a good healing of the ocular surface. So in conclusion, uh, the use of uh, autologous uh, serum tears is effective in the treatment of endotrophic keratopathy or keratitis. It's safe, it's, uh, uh, it works, and we have a lot of experience with this. And uh, usually, you know, we'll need to do studies to get regulatory approval and coverage. And the next frontier for the treatment is to really identify what these factors are in the hematopoietic system and use them to uh, treat uh, ocular surface diseases. Thank you.